Dr. Amber Selking, welcome to the Mindset Advantage podcast. I've been doing a ton of research on you lately. I've been reading your book, listening to all your podcasts. I was saying off air, I feel like I know you already, but I'm excited <laughs> to share some of your content uh, with my audience. Welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me, DJ. I'm excited to be with you and uh, excited for our conversation today. Recently picked up your book called Winning the Mental Game, the Playbook for Building Championship Mindsets. Phenomenal book. I want to start with what the book starts with. And it's a poem that I know hits home for you, and it's called Thinking by Walter Wintel. It goes like this. If you think you are beaten, you are. If you think you dare not, you don't. If you like to win, but you think you can't, it is almost certain you won't. If you think you'll lose, you're lost. For out in the world we find, success begins with a fellow's will. It's all in the state of mind. If you think you are outclassed, you are. You've got to think high to rise. You've got to be sure of yourself before you can ever win a prize. Life's battles don't always go to the stronger or faster man, but sooner or later, the man who wins is the man who thinks he can. What a phenomenal way to start the book, and I think a phenomenal way to start our conversation today. Talk to me about that, that poem. Yeah, you know, it's wild. Uh, one of my favorite parts about life are just, you know, sometimes how circular they are and you 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 do something in one season of life and then 5, 10, 15, 20 years later, that thing kind of comes back around. And so uh, that poem, my mom actually had me memorize when I was 12 years old. I grew up in a small town in Montrose, Pennsylvania. My mom was an extension agent for 20 years. And so youth development is like her thing. And so, you know, public speaking, she knew was a life skill that she wanted us to have. And and so we did a lot of that. And one of those things was uh, memorizing this poem and sharing it. And so when I went, I was going back through all my 4-H books, you know, and I went back to our home one time on a on a break and um, found this poem. And I was like, holy smokes, like th I memorized this in 12, when I was 12. And, you know, now decades later, you know, this is what I get to do with my life is help people, you know, understand how to think right and the importance of our thoughts. And um, not just from a, a really powerful poem, but actually from a scientific standpoint. And so that poem has a lot of meaning in, in my life. And I like to share that with groups that I have the chance to speak with. So I'm glad we opened with that today. I love it. And I, I'm kind of weird. When I get a book, I like to read kind of the first page. And then sometimes I go to the last page of a book and I read the last page. It's goofy. I've done it my whole life. But you have a story at the end of your book that I think sets up just your path. And you went through an injury. You went to the team. You thought they were going to say something. They said something completely different. So if you just bear with me, the first part of the book, the end of the book, let's tell that story. And then I think it kind of sets up the rest of it. Yeah. So, you know, I had the uh, privilege of, of playing soccer at the University of Notre Dame. Um, I'd actually committed to the Naval Academy my senior year and then tore my first ACL a month before I was supposed to leave for plebe summer, but thankfully three days before the Notre Dame deadline. And so I uh, wound up as a preferred walk on at ND and, you know, rehabbed all fall, redshirted my fall season, was playing my spring season. And again, intended to walk into that meeting to hear from my coaches, hey, you know, you came in with 10 girls. We got another 10 girls coming in. Lots of work to do this summer, but we're excited for you because that's what my seniors had been telling me all spring, you know, and I walked in and I just heard, you know, how would you feel if you weren't on the team next year? And I mean, I was crushed, right? I, I, everything I'd done since I was seven years old or didn't do since I was seven years old was because I wanted to play college soccer and, um, and, and it just gutted me. And it was crazy that my coaches were like, okay, we'll come back in two hours and we'll tell you what we decided. And I was like, what? So I left and, you know, I was, um, trying to study. It was finals week. I was a freshman and I couldn't obviously, because my whole sort of life was, potentially crumbling in front of me. And I remember just checking my email kind of mindlessly and I was getting daily devotionals from FCA at the time. And it was funny because we signed a ton of stuff. Like every day we were the number one ranked team in the country. And like every day we would sign stuff for little girls. And I would always sign it. A lat, my maiden name is Latner, a lat Jeremiah 29, 11. And you know, 29 was my number in college. 11 was my number in high school. I was 29 because two plus nine equals 11 and athletes are crazy about our numbers. And I thought, Oh, that's a great, verse if anybody ever actually reads it, you know, on the ball or poster I signed for him. Cool. And so I opened, I, I opened this email and it starts Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans that I have for your life says the Lord plans to prosper you and not to harm you, to give you a hope and a future. And I read that. And like, I just knew, like I was about to get cut from the team and, and, and yet 
there were plans and there were purposes and I had to hold on to that promise. And so what I thought I had been writing for nine months for someone else was building a mindset in myself that there is hope, there is a future, it's not over. And so I went back into that meeting at that point. I was like, they're not going to see me cry again, you know, and I just chewed apart the inside of my mouth and uh, they they released me from the team. And I just remember walking out of the the Jack. It's sort of the where, where all the coaches offices used to be. And I was standing on the corner and I like started to walk one way and I stopped and I was like, I don't want to go to my dorm right now. And I started to walk to the, the weight room and I was like, wait a minute, I can't go to the weight room anymore. You know, and I just for the first time in my life, I felt hollow from like the base of my neck to the bottom of my stomach. And I'm like, if I'm not Amber, the soccer player, like, who am I? You know, and I had this identity crisis and um, you know, it took me a while to navigate through that. I decided to stay at Notre Dame. I felt like you know, God had called me to Notre Dame, but I was just too stubborn to, you know, go there if I didn't think I could play soccer. And so I wound up staying. I'm grateful that I got to sort of be in that bubble and navigate that identity crisis for the next couple years and in, in sort of this safe environment, you know. Um, but that that really set the stage, you know, for this thinking about, man, when sport is over for people, what do they do? You know, because I came to this realization that, hey, listen, I have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I got a family at home that loves me. I'm at the University of Notre Dame. Like, eh, fairly certain my life is going to be okay, you know, but I was still devastated. And, and I just thought, what about people that have none of that? Then what? And so that's what really, um, you know, I led Notre Dame Christian athletes during my, the rest of my time at Notre Dame and thought that was my way to ease my ego out of sport. I uh, went and worked in corporate America because that was my goal and dream at the time. And um, and very soon realized that, man, my heart was still in athletics and there has to be something more. And that's when I found the field of sports psychology. And I was like, wow, this is it. You know, this is what athletes can hold on to when their sport is over. This is what our veterans can hold on to when they leave the military. Like this is what people can hold on to when they retire from, you know, a career that they've poured their whole life into. And so this essence of identity and mindset and how that really comes into play is sort of the foundational why that I do what I do um, to hopefully help people understand that thinking is where it all starts and, and where it can lead us even in the darkest moments of our lives. That's such a great place to start. And oftentimes what I'm seeing in my work is that athletes aren't having this conversation. They're not thinking about it uh, until the moment comes where the season ending, career ending injury comes or they get cut from the team. And then we see a spiral, right? We see, you know, people even like Michael Phelps have come out and said, you know, publicly that he was had suicidal thoughts. And 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 after after you're done playing, who are you? And identity is such a huge piece of it. Dr. Amber, I want to ask you, what's the advice to the athletes out there listening who maybe are just going through a traumatic injury, maybe just got cut from their team. What do you say to those athletes right now? There are plans and purposes for your life and there are plans to prosper you and not to harm you, to give you hope and a future. I think one of the things that I thought about, like, did I just waste 17 years of my life? Well, I guess not 17, but like 11 years of my life at that time. Like, what did I do? And, and I, Thankfully, as I thought through that and I and I had some mentors that spoke truth. So I would say get around people that know you and love you. Do not isolate. Human beings are created to be in community. Our bodies actually release different hormones that are helpful for your heart health, for your mental health. And isolation is the easiest thing that we do. Um, so do not isolate. Get yourself around good people that will speak truth to you. And then um understand that all of your life that you've dedicated to this thing is not in vain. It is literally his, is what has created you to be the individual and the competitor, the leader that you are for what's next in your life. And I think that's, that was one of the reasons why I decided to stay at Notre Dame and not transfer. I felt like as I really thought about it, if I transferred to play somewhere, it was kind of a lateral movement. Like I, I just had this sense that soccer had taken me as far as it was going to take me in my life. And there, and now listen, it took me, you know, two years to really figure out, well, then what is it going to be next? You know? And, and so it is a journey, but man, um, stay around people that know you and love you and have best intention in, in their minds for you. And then, you know, understand that all that you've done has gotten you where you are, but something else is going to get you where you're going next. 
next and and to just lean into that discernment process um and and it will come to you because i believe that when we seek we find you know um it it but it takes that intentional effort to really seek and explore who am i what am i supposed to do next yeah i don't know how familiar you are my back my background is in the sport of crossfit and crossfit is now in this stage where you know they're about 15 to 18 years into the development of the sport. And now we're seeing a lot of athletes, specifically female athletes, Dr. Amber, stepping out and saying, I don't know who I am anymore. I've put all my identity into this. I've become obsessed with being the fittest version of myself and being this athlete. And we're seeing right now in 2024, more than we've ever seen athletes step out of the game, take a year off, do all these different things. And it's been hard to see, but it's also great to see because they're, they're getting the message out, especially for younger females, because now what's happening is the sport is starting even earlier. So it used mm. to be CrossFit to be like after high school or college or even later. And now kids are getting into it at nine, 10, 11. So the burnout is starting even earlier. So mm -hmm. it's just, it's, it's interesting to see how it's kind of this borderline. Cause you see the message of, if you want to be great, you have to be obsessive. Well, is obsessive the right word? Can we still have a healthy relationship with it? And then there's a, the identity piece too. There's a lot of little moving parts to it to make sure that you don't get to that point of, of burnout. Yeah, you know, and, and that's huge. I think that to be great at anything, you have to invest yourself at a deeper level than the average population is willing to, right? But I do think... You know, the balance is an interesting concept. You know, I don't think we ever really have like, you know, one third of my life is this and one third of my life is this and, you know, whatever percentages you want to break down. Um, but I do think, you know, there's seasons of life that you go through where certain things need to have more of a focus and a priority for you. Like I hear young professionals in the work spot, like, well, I want a workplace. Like I want to have work-life balance. So I need to be done by four 30 so that I can do this and I can take, I'm like, listen, you're early in your career. If you want to be great, guess what this season is about work, work, putting in the time. And so I think that that's something that I try to, when I encourage people about like time management, to me, it's more about like what season of life are you in and what needs to be prioritized in this season of your life. And then you have to be real with yourself of when is the next, when am I into the next season? Right. And that's, that's one of the harder discernment pieces. And that's why it's important to have really good people in your life that can help you say like, Hey, you're in a new season. Like your life needs to look different now. You need to reprioritize your time. And to me, that's where we get a macro sense of balance and work life integration that, that needs to happen. I think for us to maintain a sense of mental and emotional control over, over our environments. Yeah. I love that. Alex Hermosi talks about this sometimes where he thinks it's kind of a comical joke where people want to follow these influencers, these celebrities that have this like four hour AM routine and then they meditate for hours and then they work out and they don't, you know, they do all these things. And, and the, the, the concept is Alex Ramos says, don't copy what they're doing now. Cause they're at the top. They can do those things. Go back to 10, 20, 30 years ago. That's, that's the work you need to put in. Don't copy their work ethic, what they're doing now. Cause it looked a lot different 20 years ago. And sometimes that's a light bulb moment, especially with the social media kind of being where it is now. It, well, and then too, maybe some of them were doing this 20, 30 years ago, or maybe they're in like year two and you can do anything for two years, you know, and then all of a sudden, guess what? They burn out because who really can do four hours of a morning routine for 35 years of your life? You know, like what else do you have on your life? Probably not much. Like, I mean, I, I don't need, that's not even realistic. <laughs> so I, you know, I also think like, I'm, I'm always curious. That's, and honestly, it's one of the reasons why I wanted to be on your podcast. John Gordon, um, I asked him to be on my show one time and, and, and we did some stuff together and he, he gave me this really good insight. He always looks at how many episodes of a podcast someone's recorded. And if they're in like, season one or show 10, he's like, listen, like I, I would love to be on your podcast when you can demonstrate that this has been a commitment for you, then I'll commit to this for you as well. And so, you know, I, would you say you're on 360 episode 365, right? right? Which is, which is incredible. And, and I just, I appreciate that sense of dedication. And, and those are the things that, you know, I want to be a part of. So when I'm looking at some people's work, like that's also what I look at as well of like, you know, how, and, and, you know, we're both relatively young in our careers, so you can only do what you can do in life as well. But that sense of commitment, I think, is really important to to see how people are operating.
There's another part, page six. We're not getting very far. We're only on page six to this book. <laughs> this, this book, this book is so good. But I, I, I underline this uh, quote here. I'm, I'm curious if we could break it down because I think this has some something to do with identity. He said, "Being a student athlete at the University of Notre Dame, I wanted to build a bridge between the strong athletic identity we all embraced and the personal identity of the man or woman who was under that jersey. Because, and the quote is, I know that the human could always outperform the performer. I know that the human could always outperform the performer. Can you break that down? Yeah, you know, I, I think sometimes when we're working with like identity conversations um, or talking about transitions out of sport, people think like, oh, I'll do that when I'm done, right, with playing. And my dissertation was actually on the transition out of the NFL and so interviewed like former players on that sort of mental emotional experience and then sort of deconstructed their experiences to put together a framework of, well, what does this transition really look like and what did they do to navigate the transition out? And once we built that framework, it became very clear to me that the things that they did um, to transition out were actually things that would have helped them be a better football player if they had engaged in them early on. So interesting. So I think that sometimes, again, we think, oh, I don't have time to work on identity. I have to work on my technique, right? Well, the reality of it is by working on some of these identity pieces, these mental and emotional skills pieces, it's actually amplifying and enhancing your ability to do the thing that you want to do better and with more mental and emotional stability. And so um, to me, the human will always outperform the performer. If you don't know who you are under the jersey, then, then that's a, like that. Think about that's like a body with nothing inside of it. Like you got your Jersey on, but it's hollow, it's empty. Right. And so you can get pushed over easily. You can get the air taken out of you really easily. You can deflate really easily, but man, if you know who you are on the inside and then you put that Jersey on, man, nobody can touch you. Like the wins and losses don't have to drive how you show up to life, how you think about yourself. And so that sense of, of knowing who you are allows you to win and lose as a champion consistently, right? And not as a winner, as a loser. I win and I'm a, if I win, I'm a winner. If I lose, I'm a loser. And that is just a, that a very emotional, volatile place to live. And that's where most people live right? They're playing well, they're feeling good. They're not playing well, they're not feeling good. And when I say playing well, that could be in sport, in your relationship, in business, like whatever that is. And so this sense of identity, I think really drives a consistency so that we can show up, we can, we can take the blows that high performance and work and life and love demand of us, um, but allow us to, to, again, keep moving forward on a day-to-day -day basis with that sense of grounded confidence, you know? Yeah. Separate the who from the do. I think it's the foundation when we talk about building an elevated mindset. It really needs to start there. I'm so glad that you emphasize that. I have a couple, I'm a mental performance coach, Dr. Amber. So I have a couple questions that are going to kind of scratch my own itch and then we'll get into some of the stuff yeah. from the book. But I've been just so curious to ask you specifically, you've been working with coach Kelly for a number of years. And personally, I think one area where the field of mental performance could very well be heading is really equipping the head coaches with the strategies and drills and skills to be able to then bring it to their players of mental performance. I think there can be, you know, depending on the field you're in, especially in high school, or if you're giving keynotes, when we really see an impact is when the coaches can carry the torch because people like you or I, or a speaker, we might come in and blow it out. It might be awesome for a whole day. And then it's like, well, what happens the next day? And the coaches kind of have to need to, do they have to carry some of this language? So I'm curious for you, if you feel the same way, Dr. Amber, how do you equip a coach like Brian Kelly or other coaches that you've worked with? How can you do it? How do you do it? How can mental performance coaches out there listening? How can they help equip the coach so then they can make a bigger impact and thus make a more mentally strong team, if that's, if that's making sense. Yeah, for sure. You know, I was blessed to be able to do my PhD with Dr. Rick McGuire at the University of Missouri. And so we call him coach, uh, coach McGuire. He was a head track coach at Mizzou for 37 years and, um, and then ran the sports psychology department there for 27 years. And he, he's sort of a grandfather in the field of sports psych, um, started the USA track Olympic track and field sports psych program. Um, and, and his philosophy is sports psychology best happens to and through the coach. And so we say that a lot to and through the coach. Um, because an athlete might spend an hour with me or, you know, maybe three hours a week with me, but they spend a lot more time with their position coaches. And so 
coach McGuire would always say sports psychology is just learning to think right in sport. And so thinking right happens as you're watching film, as you're on the practice field, as you make a great play, as you make a terrible play. And so this idea of to and through the coach is a critical element of how, how we function our, um, our, our program and in general. And so I'm to the point now where like, unless a head coach or a CEO is 100% committed to doing this work and owning it and driving it, like I'm not really interested in working with them because I don't think it works. And I'm not in this to say like, I work for X NFL team, you know, like it's, I, I want to do this to win. I want to win in kids' lives, athletes' lives. I want to live in employees' lives and I want to win in the sport and in business. And I know what that takes. And so I, I want to work with people that know how to build that. So we refer to it as building a comprehensive integrated high performance system. And so comprehensive, everything that touches our student athletes, everything that touches our employees, I serve as an executive for a, a global manufacturing company as well. And so in culture and leadership, And so we look at like everything that touches our people, that's comprehensive and then integrated. All that can't operate in silos. It has to be integrated around the the goal, right? And in college athletics, it's the student athlete. And so, um, and, and then that has to get owned and driven by and held accountable by the head coach or the CEO, because at the end of the day, like. I love our assistant coaches and they love me, but they're not going to do what I tell them to do, you know, unless coach Kelly tells them what to do, unless Jason Lippert, our CEO tells them what we're going to do. And so, you know, that's, I I think that's a critical part in really building a sustainable, high performing culture. And, and those are the types of leaders and coaches I want to be around and work with and partner with. And, you know, coach Kelly's a, phenomenal leader and he knows the game so well and he knows the system so well. And I don't know all those things, right? Like I have an area of expertise and he's got areas of expertise, but when we come together on that and and the same is true in the business, you know, the, the, the executives and the presidents that I work with in our company, like they know our industry. And so they're, they've got wisdom in the space that they're leading. And then we weave in some of these high performance, like what we know about human high performance and it can, it can take off in really powerful ways. So it sounds like step one is make sure that the head coach or the leader is on board with what you're doing and and they can be present in the sessions. I think that's powerful too. Like if you're speaking to the team, make sure they're in the room. It sounds like second strategy could be have frequent conversations. I'm sure you and and coach Kelly meet quite often. Is that the second strategy? And if, is there a third kind of, if we just break it down into football or into high school or college sports, is that the second strategy? And if so, what do you think the third one would be? Yeah, I would say too, just making sure that everything that touches your your players are aligned with what you're saying. So what's on your walls? What's on your what's in your playbook? You know, what's what's the pre-practice speech? What's the post-practice speech? What's the I mean, everything has to be aligned, right? Because repeated thoughts build mindsets. Thoughts are not these ephemeral things that float around in the air. They're actual electromagnetic currents that get sent from your brain through your body. And thoughts are like bicep curls for your brain. So every time you think a thought, that's a mental rep. And those repeated thoughts are what build mindsets. And so everything you say, mental rep. Everything they see or read on the walls, mental rep. And so if those are all over the place or disparate, they're not building the consistent mindset. Um, and then the, the third part is you got to model it, right? Like but po- <laughs> Coach Kelly talks about positive coaching now, right? And we talk about being demanding, but not demeaning. And so you can talk about that, but then if guys don't experience that on a day-to-day basis, that can undermine the culture. So you have to you have to put a clear message together. Everything that that is around and touching your players has to reiterate that message. And then- maybe most importantly, you got to model that. And because the number one way humans learn is through the modeling effect. And, and so, you know, that, that comes into play and coach and I have had some really powerful conversations over the years of like, you know, what's going on in the program and what he's saying in front of the team and, and where there's misalignment. That's why he, that's why the accountability goes to him, you know, on everything. And he's, relentless about that. And, um, it's powerful to see and powerful to watch him lead in that way. Um, but that's also why coaches need people on their staffs that they can trust because you also can't see and be around everything. 
And we are blessed down at LSU right now to have an incredible staff, incredible sport performance staff where everybody's hearts are there for the guys. And, and so when anything's off, you know, we can bring that to the table and, and as a leader, you got to be willing to hear it and, and then address it. And that's, you know, I, I think a huge part of this. Demanding versus demeaning. I got to ask mm-hmm. you to break that down. Yeah. Again, that's a Dr. McGuire quote, demanding, not demeaning. Cause you talk about positive coaching and, and people are like, Oh, okay. Let's, let's everybody be happy and hold hands here. Okay. And so, and again, if that was my pitch to coach Kelly eight years ago, we wouldn't have gotten very far, but here's the thing the the brain in a positive state thinks more clearly, thinks more creatively, and it problem solves better. Those are things we want our guys doing every single day, but particularly when things are not going really well, right? We want them in that positive state. Well, where do athletes get their thoughts from? Often what their coaches are saying to them. And so we don't mean be soft. We don't mean be fluffy. We don't mean blow smoke up their (laughs) tail end, right? I don't know if we can swear on this podcast, but, um, and so, uh, you know, so, so, but you can be demanding, but don't demean them. Right. And, and coach Holtz has a good, uh, saying to sort of amplify that he says, you know, criticize the performance, but never the performer. Right. I've heard coaches say, Hey, you stupid mother effer. Like, what are you doing out here? You know, like, I can't even believe you're playing college football. Oh, well, that's a great thought for your kid to go back to the bench with. So then he's sitting there. He's like, man, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if I'm good enough to play here, blah, blah, blah. And then what do you do? Offense goes back on the field. Like, All right, bud, here we go. Next play. And, and he's just spent the last minute and a half thinking about how terrible he is. That's not conducive to high performance, right? Demanding sounds like, listen, you're better than that. You are here for a reason. You've got powerful hands. I want you to strike him in the chest and get off the line. Step it up. Let's go. That doesn't sound soft and fluffy to me. That's demanding. And then he's like, yeah, you're right. I can do a strong hand, strike him, right? And now he's thinking about the right stuff on the sideline. So when he does go back in, Those are the thoughts that he's bringing to the table. And what we know, again, is our thoughts affect our emotions. Our emotions affect our physiological or our body's response. And that's what's going to drive our performance in the moment. So we want them thinking right thoughts that set that process up for success, that get them in the right emotional state, that gets their bodies in the right physical state, so they can go deliver what we want them to deliver in the moment. That's great stuff. Something else I was curious on, you spent some time at Notre Dame, now at LSU, you've spent some around the best college football athletes on the planet. I'm curious to know, is there a moment when you have to convince them that this is for them or, hey, get on board? Or are all these guys coming to you, Dr. Amber, they're like, I love it. I want it. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. What does it look like in some of those beginning stages? I'm thinking almost like the freshmen that come in because I'm assuming that Mm -hmm. sophomore, junior, senior, they're like, hey, this is what we do. It works. Roll with us. But what's that look like when an incoming group comes in and maybe there's some ego, maybe there's some really high talent in the room, I could imagine. What does that look like on your plate? And what are some of the strategies that have worked well for you as the men's performance coach? Yeah, you know, it's always easier to come in and help people when they're struggling, right? So I came into Notre Dame after their four and eight season and, uh, and coach Kelly, again, he's a, he's a master, right? And he's like, all right, let's start with our quarterbacks. Let's see like if they get this, you know? And so we started with our quarterbacks and, and Tommy Reese was our quarterbacks coach at the time. And, you know, so he's sitting in the room and I've just got our QBs and we're taking them through and they're loving it. And Tommy's loving it. And he's like, dude, I wish. I had this when I was playing. Right. And so then coach is like, all right, cool. We're going to roll this out to the defense next. Cause our defense, they struggled that year. And there was a lot of volatility in the coaching staff. And so, um, and, and they knew they did not perform to their capability. And so they were hungry. Like they were hungry for like, to be able to understand what had just happened to them and to have that hope and belief that that's never going to happen again. And so they were all in and they were hungry and taking notes. And then they were applying it in the weight room and on the, on the running field and, 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 and strength and conditioning. And so then all of a sudden the offense, cause the offense wasn't horrible, you know, like it wasn't their fault necessarily. We went four and eight, but like they're seeing the defense and hearing this new language and seeing them do stuff and talk about stuff and get excited to go to mental performance training. And they're like, dude, what the heck? Like, why don't we get MPT? Mm -hmm. And so coach is like, okay, let's roll this out to the office. So again, just leadership, right. And him knowing his team. And, and so, uh, and, and the whole staff went to, so we had basically a brand new staff at the time. And so they had never seen or heard anything like this before either. And, um, and we're excited 
because coach was also excited and man basically was like, this is what we're going to do and how we're going to operate. And so, you know, they were really open and that buy-in was really strong. It was really cool then to see over the years, it just became how we operated. And we had the winningest five years in the history of Notre Dame football. You know, we won 10 plus games, went, had two 12 and 0 seasons, went to two playoffs um, in those five years. And so it then became just how we operated. And so it was really cool then, you know, with some of our freshmen, they didn't necessarily, they'd never really lost. All they knew was winning. And this was part of what it was, but it was really neat. We had one of our guys at Notre Dame, he came in and, and he was great in my sessions and, you know, just a fun, loving, happy freshman kid and, um, and, and had a great mindset. But then he, we went to LSU, he transferred to Texas and then wound it up, wound up coming to LSU for his last year. And he went through the same program again as a senior. And he comes up to me, he gives me this big hug. And he's like, doc, first of all, I didn't realize what I was sitting in my freshman year. So I'm sorry if I was a, if I was a tool back then. And he's like, I was like, I don't remember. He's like, I just remember being silly. And I was like, yeah, but you were present and it was fine. And he's like, but now like looking at my journey, I realized like all the skills that I learned there I've used, like I wouldn't have been able to navigate my journey. Like I've kind of forgot where this came from because it's just, again, how we operated. And then, you know, then he had his experience at Texas and then he got to come back and man, he, he who he was as a fifth year. It, it's just so fun to see these guys come in as babies, you know, and then see him leave as, as grown men that really understand the power of mindset. So you know, I think it's actually harder when you come in and, and teams are doing really well because you don't necessarily understand it. Um, but when you can come in in that way and then it takes root, it's just how people operate and and it becomes part of their process. And, and then when they leave, they realize, oh, this is why we were so good. You know, our culture and our mindset was so on point and, and it helps them be better leaders, I think, on the back end. Dr. Amber, what would you think, what would you say is your biggest challenge as a mental performance coach at LSU when it comes to working with athletes? What's your biggest challenge? Um, you know, I think, I think just everybody's openness and readiness is in a different stage. And so, um, I, I think we've got a good rhythm in place where everybody gets exposed to this. And then there is ample opportunity for ongoing work when they're ready. And, and I think that, you know, my faith is really important to me. And there's a, there's a, a cool verse in the Bible that talks about like, you know, some, some people till the soil, some people plant the seed, some people water it and some people harvest. And I think sometimes coaches, teachers, parents, even, you know, we can get frustrated. Like we're not seeing the harvest, you know, I want the harvest and, and that can even be an ego thing. And so I just try to always remind myself, man, for everybody in this room, some people are just tilling the soil. Some people are getting seeds planted right now. Some are getting watered and man, some are about to just have this explosive growth that we are going to see the harvest in. And I think that being continuing to remind myself of that and, and letting kids grow. And, um, and then I think just the consistency of the staff, you know, uh, again, I've worked for different coaches. I've had some different experiences and, you know, some have been all in and some don't really understand how all encompassing this has to be to work. And so I think if not just at LSU, but in general, I think one of the things I've learned over the years is like how hard it is if you don't really have that commitment and that support and that integrated approach from your senior level leader. Um, and that's why it's kind of like a new element of criteria for me. <laughs> yeah, that's phenomenal. Great answer. I'm so glad you said that because that's been something on my mind recently as well. My dad's a motivational speaker. He's been traveling the country for 34 years. And I, I came in one time after a session that I did and I was like, you know what? It seems like, you know, there's a third of the group that they really dig it. And then the third of the group, I can't really tell them. There's a third of the group that I can't help these guys. I was frustrated. They don't seem like they're listening. And, I, and, and he, and he ca taught me kind of that same lesson. He goes, DJ, what you're doing is you're planting seeds. And you're mm -hmm. planting these seeds and someday what you hope for is 10 years from now, one of those kids comes back to you and says, you know what? It hit. It finally hit. For some of the kids, it's going to hit as soon as the words leave your mouth. For others, yeah. you hope that it's just planting seeds and having that thought. I mean, whether you're a coach or a teacher out there, it's such a it's such a great insight or kind of a, a feeling in your heart just knowing that it might not hit now, but at some point 
it's going to hit with them and they're going to be like, man, that stuff was awesome. As a presenter and as a coach, that feels good just kind of knowing that it's going to hit at some point. Yeah, I just pulled my phone up and I uh, because I got a text actually this morning from one of my guys that was in year one or two of my time at Notre Dame. And he sent me this little video, the effect of words on water. And he said, I saw this and wanted to share. Thank you always for your impact on my life and helping realize how impactful our thoughts are, you know, and he's one that got it in the moment. Actually, I have a pair of his cleats here. He gave me the first pair of cleats he ever played in at Notre Dame when he graduated. Um, and, and so he was one that got it. And then one that continues to get it, you know, and, and, and I randomly will get these little messages from him. And it's like, you're like, man, this is, this is why we do what we do. And you just never know where and how it's going to land. But when it comes back around and you see it, you're just grateful for the opportunity that you've got to intersect their lives, you know, however long or short that might've been. Yeah, it's a great reminder. Okay, finally, let's get into some of the great stuff with the book here. I have a couple of my favorite plays that we'll go through, but in order to really set the table, I think we first need to talk about how you emphasize in the beginning, and I love this way the way you frame this, thoughts, emotions, physiological response, performance. This lays the foundation. We can't go further into these plays until me and my audience understands this further. So break this down for me, if you will. Thoughts, emotions, physiological response, then performance. The entire process begins with a thought. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what we think about creates an emotional response, right? And then our emotions start to trigger your heart rate, your muscle tension, your visual field actually expands and constricts on this process. Your hormones change on this process, right? And ultimately how our bodies are will determine how we perform in the moment. And so what starts the process? Thoughts. And who controls your thoughts? You do. And so I think that that's one of the things things that we, we actually start every mental performance training session with that. And the guys say it out loud together. And because if they learn nothing, I want them to know this. Now, the reality of it is, um, a lot of times we recognize our emotions first, right? That's why we have emotions. They're really good indicators, but then people will just run away with those emotions versus being like, man, I'm angry right now. I'm a little anxious right now, or, um, I'm excited right now. If you step back and you, you're like, well, what am I thinking about? That's creating this feel, this feeling. Then you start to recognize like, oh, this is how I'm thinking about this situation or this moment or myself right now. And, and if you don't believe me, try this, like, like literally start thinking about something that you know makes you sad or gets you angry and then watch what happens to your body and then see how you show up to the people around you and then just as quickly i want you to start thinking about something different and notice how you feel and notice how your body starts to release and relax and um and that's the power of our thoughts. And it was really awesome. In, a, in our, one of our first sessions with LSU football, we had the full team there. One of my guys sitting in the front line, front, one of our defensive linemen, he raised his hand. He's like, Doc, like I hear you, I see you, but like I've seen some shit. How, can we really control our thoughts? Mm -hmm. And I said, man, I appreciate that. And I appreciate the courage it takes to say that in front of your teammates. And here's the reality. We can't always choose which thoughts come into our mind right? Thoughts can come from wherever, but we do get to choose what we do with those thoughts once we're aware of them. And, and that's why we start play. Number one is awareness because you have to be aware before you enhance, you know, we, humans have about 70 to 80,000 thoughts a day. And most people are very unaware of the thoughts that are running through their mind. So when you start to become aware of these thoughts, now you can start to take them captive and be like, man, is this thought helping me? feel the way I want to feel, be the, the way I want to be, or is it hurting me? And if it's hurting me, what should we do? Change it. And I think sometimes people are like, just don't think that. Well, in the brain, there's no don't, there's only do, right? You have to actually change it. You have to replace it with a right way of thinking because you, yes, like we've all been through things. We've all seen things. We've all done things, right? And, and varying degrees of good or bad. I don't even like to label that, right? Like it's your experience, it's your life, whatever that is like for you, but how you choose to think about that experience or that moment will then change how you feel about it and, and how you can show up to the next moment. And so that's, that's like one of the things that we fundamentally need to get our guys to, to understand and to be thinking about. One of them said like, I've never doc, I've never thought so much about what I've been thinking about. And, and so, you know, we want people to start thinking about what they're thinking about and then choosing those right thoughts that 
that create right emotions that give you a right physiological response. And so, you know, positive, productive, right, helpful, whatever thought word you want to use, those are the kind of thoughts we want to create positive, helpful, productive emotions to create positive, helpful, productive physiological responses, and then drive that performance. So the first thing that comes to my mind is probably conversations, conversations with you. And second is probably journaling could be a helpful way to do this. What do you guys do at LSU football to help them be a more aware of their thoughts or, or to be able to replace them? What's the strategy that you guys are using? Well, again, that's why to and through the coach is really important. And so, you know, we have a condensed coaching call sheet for these mental plays that they can, you know, use when they're out on the field, like, Hey, they think right, you know, or just give them right thoughts. Like, Hey, this is a practice rep, right? Next rep, next rep. You're fine. Next play. Um, and so next play is, is a really good one. What's important now, you know, Hey, you know, what's important now, next play we have them right. Um, in, co- in the play number three, we, in confidence, we talk about power statements and these are just positive, powerful, productive statements about yourself, your mission, your team. And, um, and so we have a, a lot of guys will write them on their wrist, you know, just as reminders of, of who they are and, and what to think right in the moment, you know? So those are some strategies, again, just co- coaches and how they communicate, um, thinking right. And then how guys are even talking to one another is, is really important. And so, j- you know, when you hear them saying breathe, you know, fundamentally breathing is the number one way to reset our central nervous system. Um, Hey man, you're fine. Like next play, what's important now? Like all of these things are, are some of the dialogue that our guys are having lock in, You know, they say that we say that a lot to each other and um, those are just giving them right thoughts to get right emotions, to get that right physiological response. I love that. Uh, I want to go to play number three, because this is a statement I say all the time. Confidence is a choice. I say it a lot. So my listeners know that I I want you to talk about it because we agree so much that it is a choice. And I love the way you broke it down with the different five different layers there, but take it. We could do a whole podcast. on this. We could do a whole book on this, but talk to me about why confidence is a choice. Yeah. So this is from coach McGuire as well. You know, he would always say confidence is a choice. Why? Because confidence is just a thought and who controls your thoughts you do. And so now some people choose confidence and that that is not grounded confidence. Right. But he, he would always joke. He's like, I'd rather they choose confidence than not when they step up to the line. And so our job, you know, as coaches, as leaders is to, to make sure that we instill fundamentals of, you know, physical, technical, tactical, mental prep that allow that to be a grounded logical choice. But it's actually shocking to me, you know, how many elite athletes are not confident. You know, when I, when I work with guys in the league, you know, some are like, well, you know, I was only a third round draft pick. I'm like, bro, you got drafted in the NFL, you know, or like they first round draft pick, but like, man, nah, my, my signing bonus wasn't like so-and-so's was. And so they're walking or like, I'm not, I wasn't drafted. Right. And so their confidence is like, you know, really, really low. And it, in, in versus thinking, man, I'm less than 1% of the population in the world that's playing this game right now, or that I got drafted. And so, um, helping them really think right about where they are and what they're doing and their skill sets and their capabilities is, is critically important. And, um, and, and so that's a choice and you have to choose to think that way, um, so that you can show up and, and really, deliver what you came here to do. You know, life is short. And, um, and, and so I, it's also interesting to me, like when you talk with athletes, they think like everybody's criticizing them. And I'm Mm -hmm. like, at the end of the day, no one really thinks that much about you. I hate to break it to you. Like when you're at practice and not playing well, your teammates really aren't thinking that because they're thinking about themselves and what everybody else is thinking about them. And, you know, your coaches, um, they are, they're going to be critiquing you and film is going to come up in that. But the, the podcast, the local radio guy, he's going to say one thing and people are going to move on with their lives and you're going to hold on to this and it's going to derail the goals that you have for yourself. So let's think, right. Let's reset and refocus and, and choose confidence. Cause that's, what's going to benefit you most on the next play, which is how you rewrite that story for everyone else. And the play in that chapter is I am statements. Can you tell my listeners about that? Yeah. So those I am statements are, are those power statements that we talked about. And, and so I am, you know, fill in the blank, strong, powerful, equal, a threat. I am worthy, 
I am, I'm prepared for this. I'm here for such a time as this, you know, these are all statements that when you say to yourself, say them to yourself, like they start to shift your belief about who you are and what you're capable of and, and, and your presence. And so those, I am statements can really help flesh out that identity, you know, that we talked about as well. Um, and then, um, just again, give you right thoughts at the moment of execution and in where you are and what you're trying to accomplish. I want to go through two more plays that I really enjoy. The intensity management. I've, I've read a lot of books on on the mental game. I haven't seen a lot of an intensity management. This was great, and I think it's something that is super applicable. All athletes can really hone in on what this means to find your optimal zone, whether you're too high or too low. Teach my listeners about intensity management. Yeah. So this is out of Hannon's uh, theory, individual zones of optimal functioning. So it's a, uh, you know, they did done a lot of research that look get like they the sign the word they use is like your arousal levels i work with college football players so i don't say arousal levels often <laughs> uh we call it intensity management right your your level of upness the intensity the the amount of energy that you're bringing to a moment and um and what hannon found in his study is that you know some people deliver their best when they come with a lot of energy right they're really amped up they're jacked up they're talking a lot they're moving a lot and they they play at a very high level some athletes compete they're better when they're quiet, they're locked in, they're chill, they're relaxed, right? They're breathing slow, they're nice and loose. And then some are somewhere in the middle of that. And so, um, you know, football is always interesting because it's this hyper masculine environment that I think everybody, you know, historically has thought we're jacked up in the locker room, we're head banging, we're pounding shoulder pads and, you know, frothing at the mouth coming out. And while that might work for one third of your team, it's, it's going to actually derail the other two thirds of your team. And so we work a lot with helping our guys understand what is your optimal zone where you deliver your best and coaches understand that you're going to have some guys sleeping in their locker and some guys headbutting each other. And so we, you need to be okay with that. And players, you need to respect each other and give each other space because what you want is that dude in his optimal zone to deliver his best. Now, the flip side of that is, you know, I was a player that if you told me, you know, a scale of one to 10, what's your optimal zone, I would have been like 11, you know, and hence I had a lot of yellow cards and I had a lot of adrenaline dumps. It took me a long time to figure out how to get through a whole weekend of playing tournaments because I was so jacked up so early that I just depleted my body. And, um, I, I had some European coaches, my sophomore year of high school that really taught me how to hone that and channel that intensity, um, to, to leverage it better. And I realized that man, by dialing it back to maybe an eight, I was actually better mentally and emotionally because of that. The flip side of that is I've got some players that are like, yeah, but doc, like I'm just chill, you know, I'm chill. I'm like, okay, well, here's the thing about being chill. I'm fine with that, but you can perform better. So I want you to, to press yourself to when you get into a drill, turn up a little bit, get your, you in warm up. you got to get your motor going more. And it can't be until, you know, the, the 10th period of practice where you finally get into a rhythm. That's why you don't start playing well to the th third quarter. And so, you know, helping people understand that it's about what, performance you deliver and you got to turn up or turn down to be able to get into that. Okay. I love this. And I can't, I can't relate more because I've been in locker rooms and I've seen this. I've played in lockers. I played football and now I'm working with uh, consulting with teams. I see this. Okay. So I need to understand uh, how do we help athletes turn up? How do we help athletes turn down? What are some of the go-to strategies? Yeah. So I'll share a few here. And I, I, you know, and that's why I think the the book is really helpful. Like the subtitle you read it is called the playbook for building championship mindsets. Like it's literally written like a playbook. There's a story, there's science, there's a story, there's science. And then there's actually these tools and strategies that you can do to train your brain, just like you train your body. And it's written in a sequential way that, you know, sometimes people, they want to jump straight into optimal zone, right? It's like, but that's hard to do if you, you aren't really aware of your thoughts and your feelings yet, if you don't really know what motivates you. And so I say that only to say, I'm going to give you a couple here, but I, I need you listeners to understand that just like we all wish we could go do one of DJ's awesome workouts one day and be fit for the rest of our lives. 
that doesn't work that way. The body doesn't work that way. The brain doesn't work that way. But one of the best ways to turn up or turn down is through breathing. I mentioned that earlier. Um, so we teach our guys, you know, proper breathing to slow everything down. If you're too amped up, too jacked up is in through your nose, down into your belly and out through your mouth. And so they found that if you do that for 60 to 90 seconds, it actually resets your central nervous system. So that's one of my roles on the sideline of games is to just, when the offense or defense comes off the field, I take a lap, I check our breathing. Um, and, and it's just reminding guys to breathe, right. To slow things down so they can listen to what their coaches are telling them so they can get any adjustments that are needed and then they're ready to go. And that needs to happen quickly because if we get an interception or throw an interception, that sudden change is really important. And so breathing, um, helps you turn down, but it also can help you turn up. Right. And that's just kind of the opposite. Some power breathing where it's like strong in through your nose, strong exhale through your mouth quick to get your heart pumping. So, um, breathing is really powerful on both ends of that. And then music, Music is is another really powerful strategy. There's there's been a lot of good research done on the connection between music and our arousal levels. And so, you know, what's your pregame play playlist look like? And if you are a person that needs to be amped up, classical music might not be the way to go, right? Or like smooth R and B. But if you're a guy that needs to be slower and smooth, you know, listen to some headbanging stuff isn't your best option. So we really encourage our guys to be mindful about what they're listening to and what zone that's putting them in. And then, you know, we, our guys always have some songs collectively that they love to listen to. And so when you put that on right towards the end of the locker room and you can just start to feel this like collective flow, right. And buzz. It's a, uh, it's a really powerful thing to watch and feel, you know, and be a part of a lot of great advice there. One more piece that the mental rehearsal piece, this was cool. I never, I never knew this and this really opened my eyes. You talked about mental rehearsal, what the mind conceives, the body achieves. And if you want more confidence, look at an external perspective. If you want more competence, have a more internal perspective. This was cool. It makes total sense. I just had never been taught this before. Can you teach me and my listeners a little bit about more of what that means? Yeah. So mental rehearsal, like visualization, right? We call it mental rehearsal because we want you to incorporate all five senses, like make it as real as possible, not just seeing it. And, um, and again, if you want, if you just need some confidence, like imagine watching yourself on a big screen or even make a highlight video of yourself. And we've done that for players, you know, to, to watch on Friday night, like dude, watch yourself being great. And I think sometimes when I say that guys are like, that's not cocky. I mean, they're so, they've been so conditioned to be humble that they're like afraid to be confident sometimes. Mm -hmm. And that breaks my heart. Cause like I tell them all the time, like, dude, I want you walking out there. Like you are the man. Now you don't have to be an arrogant ass either, but you can be confident in this. And so, so, but watch yourself, watch yourself making great plays, remind yourself how good you are, how dominant you are, the, the, the how you what plays you're the absolute best at and what makes you the absolute best at your craft. And then when you go out there, think about that, right? And see yourself doing it. That drives confidence for us. But competence, if we want to learn a new skill and develop, you know, expertise in something, then get yourself inside of your body and like actually, you know, feel yourself inside of your body. See yourself looking through your helmet, feel your cleats in the grass, right? See your hands striking exactly where you want it to be. Get that feeling, that flow down and rep that over and over and over and your routes, like running your routes and what the steps feel like for you. And, you know, that doesn't mean you have to lay there with your eyes closed. Like you could go out on the field and put your helmet on and your gloves and your cleats and just, you know, run routes in your mind, but be on the field, you know, to kind of bring it to life more knowing that, you know, what fires together, wires together neurologically. So every time we have a thought, it sends out electrical signal through our body. And what's really, and I didn't know this as a player, like they're like, you know, get mental rehearsal for 15 minutes a night. And I was like, okay, I'll do that. And I close my eyes and I'm asleep because you're exhausted. But man, if I would have known that the that physical reps send and myelinate talent at the neurological level, just like physical reps, mental reps and physical reps are equal in that way, I could have found 15 minutes to, to get that competitive edge and do this because again, mental reps build talent at the neurological level, just like physical reps do. And so that's where you want to come inside and get those, get those reps to build that competence. 
and listeners, like most things with mental performance, this goes beyond athletes. If you are a presenter, a teacher, I don't care what you do, you can also get into mental rehearsal, external and internal. And Dr. Amber, this has been a lot of fun. I closed down all my podcasts with the million dollar question. The million dollar question goes like this. What do you know now that you wish you knew when you got into mental performance coaching? I'll say that again. What do you know now that you wish you knew when you got into mental performance coaching? Which is what I've learned, you know, over the years is that it's not one thing that you work on. I mean, it's this complete mental game, right? The the playbook is meant to be a foundation that, you know, because when I first started working with people, they're like, I want to work on my confidence. And so we'd be working, you know, and then like it would get to a point where you just kind of plateau and and you'd be like, man, wow, it's hard to be confident when you're so unaware. <laughs> I wish we would have done X, Y, and Z before we started talking about confidence. Cause then you're kind of reworking stuff and then it gets inefficient and, you know, and they get frustrated. And so I, you know, I think really understanding that there's a process to building a solid mental game, that if you have this foundation, it will allow you to then talk about things like mental toughness, then talk about things like emotional stability, then talk about things like accountability, but you really need that foundational piece first. And then I think the other side of that is, um, what I've mentioned a couple of times that I've learned, you know, that when I started, if I would have started out on this, but that senior level leader buy-in, if, if you're working with a team, um, it, it just, it makes a big difference because that's what I feel called to. I, I, I do think some mental performance coaches are like, I want to be there with the athletes in those moments. And like the coaching staff is the coaching staff. And so everybody has their thing. But for me, that's been a really important, uh, insight that, um, I'm grateful to have and excited for, you know, the next 10 years of this journey because of that. I appreciate the advice. Thank you. Um, all right. So winning the mental game, the playbook for building championship mindsets, phenomenal book. How can my listeners best support you? Obviously get the book while well, where books are sold. Uh, the floor is yours. How can my support, how can my listeners support you? Yeah. Um, you can find us on all the social media platforms at champ mindsets. Um, my website, selkingperformance.com. You can kind of find all the stuff on there. We've got articles. Our podcast is called building championship mindsets, uh, just wrapping up season 14. So, um, we'll, we'll kick off another season sometime this fall and, um, and then books on Amazon, wherever you want that. And if there's anything that I can do for you, um, for your organization from a keynote speaking or, or from a mental performance coaching standpoint, we have a great team of mental coaches on staff and you can send me an email directly. Dr. Selking at selkingperformance.com. But as you read and consume this stuff, I just love hearing what really resonates with people and, and really how they're using it to, to impact their lives. Because at the end of the day, that's why I do this, right? Is I feel really fortunate to have gone to a lot of school to learn a lot of stuff and uh, to be able to share this with people on a broad level. And really, you know, I believe that we can be transformed by the renewing of our mind. And I believe that sports psychology holds the keys to actually how we do that. So I, I just love, you know, hearing how people are applying it. Um, and the last, the last thing I'll say about being a mental coach is like, what I also love about it is at the end of the day, people know that they change their mind, you know, like I can be a catalyst for that, but you know, I'm not, I can't make you think anything like you, you are the person that can transform your life. And when, when people do that, I just love the sense of confidence and belief and like excitement and sense of ownership that it it gives in people. So, um, I, I love to hear about people's journeys and, and how they're, um, showing up differently for themselves, their families, the communities, you know, our world's in a really interesting place right now. And, uh, it's going to take every individual making a choice to to think right about who they are, about their gifts, about their talents, about what they can bring to the world around them and refusing to, to get pulled into either side of these crazy spectrums that are out there religiously, politically, socially. Um, and so I think think that it needs, our world needs people that are light bearers, that are hope dealers, that, um, that are grounded and can engage in meaningful conversation. And all of that begins with winning our mental game. So I'm excited to, um, see how your listeners continue to do that. And, and I just want to say thank you to you for the work that you do and the lives that you impact, um, to have that mindset advantage. Yeah. Awesome. You're somebody that I look up to in this field. So thanks again for taking the time. This is a lot of fun. Yeah. Thanks for having me, DJ and best of luck with everything. God bless you guys.